The Tyranny of the Ego Written and narrated by Burnium Acknowledgements Thank you to my wife and to everyone who, for any reason and at any time, expressed support and kindness. I would not be here if not for all of you. Preface The strong desire to write this struck me by complete surprise one December day. I would like to express beforehand that my conception of the ego has grown since writing. What I refer to as, quote, ego, end quote, would perhaps fall under the Jungian category of the shadow. My observation which I refer to in this work as ego came before my familiarity with Jung. Despite studying Jung and continuing to do so, I am unable to see how it fits cleanly into Jung's model. It is not the shadow, but it entails the shadow. It is not the ego in the Jungian sense, but it affects the ego. The quote ego, end quote, then is not merely those things about yourself that you do not wish to admit. It is not merely, in a negative sense, hiding and obscuring unpleasant realities about the self. More so, in a positive way, it builds the idol to the self demanding greatness, and to be perceived as great. Obscuring human fragility and finitude is only one of the two faces of the ego. I observe within myself, and perceive in others, a discrete core, hence the term that I use, core, from which comes self-aggrandizement and consequently self-deception in order to protect the self-aggrandizement, and ultimately this dark little core itself. It touches all parts of a person while remaining distinct and always wishing to remain unseen. The seed, the core, the little worm, various descriptions of the same thing which I encounter during active imagination, is closely related to the act of projecting, the creation of deceptive personas, defense mechanisms, the impulsive need to put down others to elevate oneself, and so on. In some, the ego, as I use the term, produces very typical behaviors and thoughts associated with being human. Even when, by great effort, they are brought to light, we do not easily admit to them, nor are inclined to evaluate them as negative. This, too, is the work of the seed within. Moreover, the core manifests itself as impulses which, by their very nature, bypass thought. The impulse to immediately rebuff criticism without due consideration is one example of such an impulse. The internal friction when considering criticism, like a rabid person drawing a glass of water closer and closer to the mouth, is the effect of the seed within. This is a story about such a process taking place by which a man discovers this little seed within himself. Not only does he discover it, but he comes to evaluate it in light of its fruit, that is to say, in light of the effects it produces in his life. Quote, you cannot have proper respect for yourself until you know that you're a monster, because you won't act carefully enough. End quote. Jordan B. Peterson Day 1. The Awakening There lived someone just like you, once similar, but now different in every way. He had a job, a dog, a home, as many do. However, something happened. You understand what it was? He was asleep, asleep to life. His life was rather a sort of living death. This he had come to realize of late. When it happened, again I know you understand what it was. The proverbial scales fell, or rather began to fall, from his eyes. He awoke in the usual way. He was alone this time, save for his dog. A beast, a lesser mammal some might say, yet the only being that still gave him tangible love and affection. He anticipated the workday to come, yet his mind was much more occupied today. So much was beginning to unfold in his mind. The entire nature of humanity and life 
was slowly revealing itself to him. Having lost so much, he was saying archetypal humanity without the garments and trinkets with which it hides itself. For what reason, he did not yet know. But what he did now know was the lie of normalcy. The lie that if he just did what everyone had always told him, he would be okay. He was never the best, not in school, not in the workplace, but was still rather exceptional when measured against his peers. He had striven to excel, competing against his peers and even his friends in a silent, implicit war to obtain success. He had a degree, and sure enough, a white-collar position in the six-figure range. Until late, he had a family. One by one, his parents and only sibling left this world. This was purely an act of God, he understood. And until late, he had a family in the sense of starting one of his own with the woman he loved. With a young child and wife, the game of life seemed reasonable still to him. This little family of his was a milestone he belatedly celebrated. Belatedly, because of the years he spent trying to grasp the next carrot on a string of success. This too had gone now. An act of God? He could not say that it was. And it also happened. Don't forget what it was. The question, what was success? This question seared its way through his mind as he desperately sought to appear composed, for whom he did not know, while he got dressed. He worked as usual, but why? This gave him a sense of wonder. The answer before had perhaps been himself, or my family. And he especially noted one or two new employees during their browbeating with the supervisor. Things said there, he thought. Should anyone just trying to make it in this world have to bear that? As the day continued, a day of important, yes, very important work, he was told, yet utterly menial upon his further consideration. He was left with the echoing thought, For what? For what? Day 2. The Center Had two days or perhaps twenty gone on in this manner, he could not say. But what had now formed in his mind was the image of society as a gas, an atmosphere, exerting constant pressure on all objects. He asked himself why his life was the way it was. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Chance? Just the product of the times in which he lived, times in which everyone goes to college, finds a career, as they say, one it is repeated that you are supposed to love, reproduces, and ends their years on this earth at last surrounded by their progeny? Yes, the words, you are supposed to love, came into his mind once more. Now, instead of generic, well-meaning advice given to him as a graduate student, the words, you should love your career, seemed more like a neurotic coping mechanism repeated by an individual hoping to find comfort from the fact that there was precious little love to be found at all in this world, let alone love of a career. My God, what is this life? he thought. His time was increasingly filled with this kind of introspection. His aspect now noticeably contained an air of melancholy and pensive reflection on very deep things. These were, in fact, comments made by some of his close co-workers. And so, as a result of the change he now saw ongoing within his being, he inspected something new. He thought, friends? What is a friend? We share a soiled bench on the third tier of this corporate galley. What does that make us friends? The pressure of society, the almost tangible physical atmospheric pressure of society as he now saw it, was forcing him into what he called the center. In his mind he had been constructing a map of society. Not a literal map of places, countries, laws, peoples, languages, 
but rather a map of the abstract structures that influence these mundane and comparison structures. He was no longer concerned with the river, but the forces that direct the river in its course. He was no longer concerned with what is, but rather, why is this what is? And in this map, he saw his life before as a desperate clawing and clambering towards the center. What is the center? The center is where the ego is least threatened. It is the safest place in a school of fish or in a huddle of penguins. Success, the nebulous, arbitrary goal of his life, was a fight to be considered normal in the center of this map. The effort to excel in school, to please those in authority, to find a good career deep inside he could take or leave whether he indeed loved it, to recreate, though inevitably with failure, the model family for which he had always striven. These were all nebulous yet very real forces pushing him into the center. Were they pushing him, though, or was he acquiescing to their influence? This he could not yet determine. Now, finding himself increasingly nearing the outside of the school of fish, he began to feel the outside world. Who are my friends? Why are they my friends? Why do I need them? Are they really friends at all? These questions arose, as did similar questions touching upon his goals, his values, his hopes, his dreams, even himself. The comments made by his co-workers, could they be a result of moodiness? Everyone in his situation, having lost what he had lost, surely would undergo some kind of change, would experience some kind of internal volatility. Or, perhaps, he dared to wonder, was he simply touching upon the true nature of things, a subject which was taboo for those in the center? Perhaps, he thought, he was finally asking the right questions. Perhaps he was finally glimpsing the nascent rays of truth that were only now reaching him because he had moved, or had been moved, closer to the outside. Day 3. The Edge He awoke. Whatever the center was, he knew he was no longer a part of it. Life, to him, now had a sense of brevity and urgency Intense feelings that had never crossed his mind when he was in the center. And by brevity, he did not mean the trite expression that life is short. Rather, he meant, if what I am just now glimpsing, still blurry and on the far horizon, if this is truly life, how can one survive five, ten, twenty, or fifty more years? His brief time away from the center was filled with newness. In a very real sense, he felt like a newborn baby glimpsing the world for the first time. He took notice of lifelong habits that had formed while he was in the center. How the atmosphere of society, or the pressure of society, whatever you may call it, had influenced him. This was the subject of deepest thought and concern for him. He was almost watching himself in the third person, snapping at minimum wage earners, yelling at his ever-loyal dog, grieving over trifles and inconveniences. And for what? This was the question. He was no longer in the process of attaining. That was how he had spent his former life. He was now in the process of becoming. He was becoming something, but he did not yet know what. He knew, however, that whatever this process was, whatever it was, that was slowly revealing itself, it was undoubtedly of the greatest importance. Work was tedium. He prepared for it and got it over with. The moment he got home it was swept away, and trying his best to gaze past the inhumanity of it all, he began searching for solace on the edge. Reading filled his time. His laptop, what had always been both an appliance and a status symbol, lay before him with dusty, crummy keyboard. This reminded him of his inner self heretofore. He was but a human, made of dust, yet had been hoarding status 
and wished to storm the gates of heaven itself, garbed in his self-attained glory. Imagining how life used to be, he could hear his old self thinking, Perhaps a year is left before this is obsolete, and I'll pile it into the garbage and get another. The truth of his repressed self-loathing dawned on him. Amassing glory and status, he was nonetheless temporary and finite. Running from the terrifying possibility that he was indeed human, necessarily entailing mortality and minuteness in the scheme of the greater world, his ego, frantically, desperately, feverishly erected the great idol to self. This feverish work by the panicked ego had directed his course until now. Rejecting reality, it had sought to construct its own, one in which he was the greatest, the god before whom all else must bow. Notwithstanding the frenzy with which the ego worked to cast this illusion upon his own mind as well as those of others, there was yet another core within him that knew the truth. The great idol which was being gilded was, to his great surprise, made of dung. The ego's frenzy was not the end in and of itself. Escaping the fearful reality of being a mere creature was, in fact, the end. And in this moment he first glimpsed himself. He had finally pierced the insulating veil constructed by his ego and now beheld the sniveling worm within, craven with fear vile and engorged with loathing and disdain. Hating itself, it thus hated the world. Seeing its own depravity, it declared everyone else depraved. Bearing the weight of guilt, it deemed everyone else, and only everyone else, guilty. And so this man, beholding the faint, rosy dawn of truth, found himself on the edge. The edge he knew was his new home. He no longer shared a home with millions of other well-groomed, well-dressed, cheap-smiling carrot chasers. This he now knew with certainty, and with passionate devotion he began learning about this entirely new sense of life. He would try to define that odd phrase, new sense of life, roughly as the experience an infant goes through as it encounters the world and formulates categories, ontologies, meanings, priorities, value systems, and literally everything else. Though a grown man, and having attained quite a few of the popular milestones, he knew more than anything that he was yet an infant. In his exploration, he found himself encountering a strange world of obscure ideologies, forgotten philosophies, disgraced doctrines, failed eschatologies, and myriad other esoteric matters. Likewise, he found many such matters that, very strangely he thought, were well discussed and yet held very little influence. Nietzsche spontaneously came to mind as he recalled his graduate studies, in which he very cursorily encountered Nietzsche during some such brief segment of an otherwise unremarkable course. Nietzsche, a man said to have done for the Western worldview what Darwin had done for Western science, oft mentioned by many an article and lecture on philosophy or 20th century politics, was, nevertheless, merely treated as an antique that one is obligated to discuss in order to sound well-read or thorough. He chose to follow this rabbit trail, encountering Thus Spoke Zarathustra, one of Nietzsche's most famous works. And, my God, he thought, coming upon the words, The loving one loveth, irrespective of reward and requital. Yes, a subtle jab at the Judeo-Christian God, he knew, and yes, there is the matter of the creator-creation distinction. But forgetting that momentarily, he wondered why it is that these words are universally agreed upon, and yet universally disobeyed. Is it for lack of will? Lack of ability? What, he wondered, what is it about this life, this race to the center, such that people affirm the ideas of peace and love nearly universally, yet functionally disavow them? There is a race for peace and love. For oneself. This is the ego, he understood. 
The race to the center is a race to protect one's ego, and the ego is protected when it is lavished with love and peace, when it is in fact worshipped. Giving peace and love to someone else, however, makes one vulnerable. Reading further, he found more. Quote, the most repugnant animal of man that I've found, did I christen parasite. It would not love, and would yet live by love. End quote. He was hit with the monumental profundity of these words. The parasite, as Zarathustra referred to them, refused to love, yet avowed the idea of love. The parasite gives no love, yet would have everyone else love them. He thought, the parasite is the greatest hypocrite, preaching love the greatest of human acts, yet refusing to enact love. Understanding this, he also realized that he was witnessing life on the edge, both in the fictional Zarathustra and the real Nietzsche. Zarathustra was a hermit who would come down to the nearby village to share his thoughts. Perhaps this is how Nietzsche saw himself. Like me, Nietzsche was gradually pushed to the outskirts of life, the edge, and somewhere in these outskirts, Nietzsche found a fountain of wisdom unseen before by humanity. There is something to be seen outside of the usual plane in which life takes place. There is something beyond ego protection, beyond the center, beyond the winds of societal change. Indeed, confirmed in his mind was the fact that there is, quite seriously, a tremendous, all-encompassing, self-deceptive veil that shrouds the center, the location housing the vast majority of humanity. Are we simply driven, as by wind, by impulses, or is there more? The center produces neurotic lives held up by cheap scaffolding made of lies, and the bodies of the trampled, oftentimes kept within some measure of sanity only by pharmaceutical mind alteration. Human lives are sacrificed to keep the scaffolding in good repair. A husband and father is laid off to please the stingy corporate bureaucracy above him. A woman accepts abuse from her boyfriend because confronting him would strike his ego and result in abandonment or greater abuse. An animal is tortured and the video posted so the sick one can achieve some sense of popularity. A war is waged to keep elite money laundering channels open, sacrificing how many young people? Miserable people leaving a scorched trail of misery behind them wherever they go. What, he thought, is the limit of this? What level of sarcophancy? What act of violence? What deceit? What lie? What theft has not been done to protect the sniveling ego? Indeed, the ego's hunger is bottomless, and there is no end to its desire. And for some reason, there is a pathological need for it to reside in the center. What would the center look like, he wondered. What would a life look like if it achieved the greatest attainable degree of centerness? He supposed that it would entail a great degree of popularity, a life in which one was beloved by everyone else. Money would never be an issue. Anything would be attainable immediately. No unfairness would exist, meaning that every insult and every wrong would be repaid. No one would get away with doing you wrong. Such perfect sentiments would entail the comfort and security of being able to look down at the mass of humanity before you, and being able to conclude that you have attained more than any of them. You have come in first place and you could always defend your position as the best. And, though at the very top, you would be considered perfectly normal. There would be no flaw, no quirk, no weirdness, nothing that would tempt your neighbors or acquaintances to ostracize you or refer to you as one of those people. This is a fascinating inconsistency exhibited by the ego, and there he realized at once is the flaw. Perfect sentiness is something only a single person can attain. It is like being at the highest point on a pyramid. It necessarily entails being different from everyone else, and yet somehow defending this position by either attaining more to stay ahead, 
or by keeping others from attaining more. Just look at the world to see what measures people go to to keep others beneath them and thereby to defend their coveted position on this metaphorical pyramid. Who would consider you normal after witnessing you neurotically fending off anyone threatening to attain to your level of success? This is the great irony of the center, that the ego fights to attain to it, even though the fight itself is counterproductive to this goal. In other words, the ego is perfectly irrational, willing to sacrifice anything to attain something it can never have. His introspection was immediately disrupted as his large dog clawed his thigh attempting to get his attention. What do you want, you damn mutt? The words proceeded as quickly and as naturally out of his mouth as though they had bypassed his brain and proceeded directly from his very essence, directly from some core within. Moved by this realization, he took his only friend outside and then back in, and with his outburst in mind, he thought, that is who I am. And looking at his friend staring loyally, forgivingly back at him, seeming to read his owner's emotions and to express an animalistic, yet strangely human level of concern, he thought, and that is who you are. Day 4. The Ego Not much for the workday, and having taken about all he could bear by now, another day or perhaps more came and went. If it was one day, it felt like a year. Is this life? This thought repeated many times. He sat down to the old laptop, feeling as though he had been in this strange process of growth and encountering reality for quite a while, and yet feeling as though his infancy continued. Oceans of thought remained to sort through. A process spurned on as he encountered the words, quote, As the heron looketh contemptuously at shallow pools with backward bent head, so do I look at the throng of grey little waves and wills and souls. Too long have we acknowledged them to be right, those petty people. End quote. He resonated strongly with these words remembering once more the idolized academics who cursorily might expose their students to them, the legions of podcasters who have much and yet nothing at all to say, who might reference them and offer a few uninspired seconds of trite commentary. The search result pages he encountered when he first searched for the spoke Zarathustra, with big corporations selling editions. The study guides on the work for students who will never consider these words and will trample over the rest in an effort to get a degree, to attain, and perhaps finally grasp the carrot on the string in the precious center, and the occasional academic treatise on the work, offered by some professor or doctorate student, hoping to hoard more recognition, tenure, or who knows what. Everything is a commodity, even wisdom. Everything is valuable, but what really is? The throng of grey little waves and wills and souls. What keeps them from seeing what I now see? Quote, just a pinprick into the veil. End quote. He referred to the thing which happened to him, of which I now remind you once more. Then he thought, and God willing, it allows a single ray of truth to cast itself upon the ego inside. It was at this point. Noticing his prescription bottle as his eyes wandered away from the screen, that he reflected upon its purpose. Long ago it was prescribed for his inexplicable anxiety and manic thinking, experiences incompatible with his old life, which must be medicated away in the old, vain pursuit of normalcy. And yet, he now realized, what else did this pill-formed substance do? He had since become critical of authority structures. Virtually all of them, of all kinds, finding that they are the human counterpart of the societal pressure or societal atmosphere he had conceived of a while ago. He found that authority structures, in other words, insulate the ego and pressure the masses into the center while making the edge a taboo. They deem the edge to be an unsafe, forbidden place of danger. Based on what authority, he asked himself. By what standard? He felt that there was indeed a sweet spot that lay short of anarchy, 
but he had yet to work this out in his own thinking. His position on the edge was deemed taboo, and was scorned by many, including all of these despicable authority systems. And what hurt him most greatly, perhaps, was the fact that this newfound life on the edge was involuntarily thrust upon him. He no longer related to his co-workers. His co-workers no longer related to him. His family, which was the apex of his quest for attainment, was also gone. And yes, though it comprised part of his quest to reach the center, there was still genuine love there. Why take that little sliver of good away? This he demanded of God, the universe, the Archon, somebody. And though this position on the edge was a burden placed upon his own willing back, the authority structures of this world still looked down their noses at him, scorning and impugning him for his position, adding more stones to bear. They are the ones decrying substances that dissolve boundaries and puncture the ego. Yet this mind-altering prescription is given official sanction by church, state, and corporation? He rejected the naive notion that their motivation was simply benign concern for his well-being. And so, like so much else, he divested himself of yet more ego insulation. Ego requires so much protection, he thought. And yet, it is the ego that tramples the downcast and downtrodden of the world. The last part he uttered out loud, feeling that his words sounded vaguely familiar. Some of the words he recalled were once sung by Pink Floyd, whom he had once considered a cryptic, strange band. Indeed, they resided more edgeward than most others. Quote, On the turning away, from the pale and downtrodden, no more turning away, from the weak and the weary, don't accept that what's happening is just a case of other suffering, or you'll find that you're joining in the turning away. End quote. But now he saw, and he felt. Everyone can see what the words say. Many can know what they mean. Still fewer can feel them. On the edge, no longer striving for an arbitrary standard of success and attainment, which he previously sought so that he could look down his nose at the less fortunate and feel self-assured and healthy of ego, he felt the power of the concepts conveyed by the words. Indeed, he could say he was still an infant in this mysterious process of change. But one thing he did know, that he had truly grasped something invisible to everyone he had previously known, even himself for most of his life. What this was felt far more real than any experience of his past. Whereas once he had gazed dumbfoundedly upon the immense world in which we live, and its massive, tangled, unfathomable web of intricate humanity, which covers the world with various forms of commerce, education, philosophies, governments, religions, and so much more, now he had glimpsed something immeasurably greater than even this. He is told this is taboo. This is evil. This is not normal. This is dangerous. To get in line and reform himself. Yet he did not choose this, but something chose this for him. Something outside of himself brought him to where he now was, full of death if measured as distance from the center, yet full of life if measured as distance outside the veil. He gazed upon his dog once more, needing the usual attention. This is you, needing me, yet so little plagued by ego, vulnerable, yet so full of peace and love. And it was as if a beam of wisdom pierced his mind. Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus and tailed dogs. Even the dogs came and licked his sores, the parable goes. He and the dogs stand in distinction to the rich man, who casts away the weak and downtrodden. His wealth and splendor shield his ego. He once treated people like that. Perhaps he was not as wealthy as the proverbial rich man, but he did. He wept and hugged the ever-attentive dog. His effort to build the model family, to climb the corporate bureaucracy, where would it all have led? He knew he was saved from something dangerous, 
and the danger was the center, not the edge. The danger was the frantic, self-preserving, self-obsessed ego that normalcy insulates. Normalcy aids and abets the ego. Normalcy tells you everything is okay, and meanwhile your ego devours you from within. Day 5. Alas. There came a time when the man we now know to some extent condensed his thoughts in the following way, quote, In some mysterious way, the world needs love and peace, and yet love and peace are not the end goal. It is as if a third unknown emergent property is produced when there is untainted, genuine, selfless love. This kind of love necessarily produces peace. And somehow an emergent property arises out of this mixture. This is true life. This is wisdom. This is some archetype that last received expression in the Garden of Eden. And perhaps the strange path through our present ego-tainted world is some kind of teaching experience requiring this excruciating struggle that will result in the reappearance of this archetype. End quote. When it happened to this man, that which you do, in fact, understand very well. His ego was left with a minuscule puncture. Such a small opening was nonetheless able to release the pressurized, insulating bubble of pus around his ego. And he understood the fragility of his ego, and yet understood that he is not his ego, but much more. I am not my ego, he uttered. Ego is not life, he said. And having died the ego, he now lived. Thank you for listening to The Tyranny of the Ego, written, narrated, and copyrighted by Bronium.